major problem was I think they ran too many events. They all actually created competition for themselves. Were I to marry again in the future, um, I still would continue to work because I don't feel any longer that the woman has the luxury of staying home. So that without the Variety Club, I think that the nursery would not would not be what it is today. Hello, I'm Bob Pyle and welcome to Five Country Close-Up. And this time when the dollar's tight, entertainment items like the theater suffer. We talked to one man who knows that all too well. His name is Jerry Bloomquist and his task, keeping Des Moines' new Civic Center afloat. There's no business like show business like no business I know. Everything about it is appealing. If anyone in Des Moines can identify with that song, it's this man, Jerry Bloomquist. Bloomquist is currently manager of the Des Moines Civic Center. He took over the helm about two and a half months ago. But I felt I was kind of an ace in the hole, too. I don't say <laughs> Well, if they had a problem here where they always knew they could fall back on me, I felt, I always felt that. Bloomquist's position is a temporary one. He was called in by the Civic Center board as a financial troubleshooter of sorts. You see, the Civic Center is having money problems. When Bloomquist came on board, previous management had overestimated revenue by more than $350,000, which caused them to overshoot their original budget. When I took it over, I think it was roughly $400,000. And we had programmed and estimated that at the end of the year it would be $651,000 in the red. Next year, we we're budgeting $360,000 to $380,000 in the red. We think we can live with that budget. We got our arms around it. We feel we can handle it, that area. Bloomquist suspects that the center would have been in good shape if they didn't put themselves in a situation where they were competing with themselves. Well, the major problem was I think they ran too many events. They all actually created competition from themselves. And when you have so many events that you give the patron a choice, eventually one or two of them suffer. And so you've got to have a just the right amount, but not too much, and uh, we had too much. Bloomquist says he feels he has a handle on the problem now. He's booking less events, and the events booked he feels are going to draw. But he says it's going to be a long old haul before the center gets back on his feet again, and even then it'll probably never operate in the black. I don't think they can. There's none in the, in the country right now operating back, no theaters. There were two a couple of years ago, and I contacted both of them, and both of them are now in the red. Uh, there are so many facilities having been built that there are uh, just not enough attractions to play them, and as a result, you've got a, a little dead time, and this is where it gets expensive. The center has attracted a lot of attention both locally and nationally since it opened. Besides being the home for Des Moines' own symphony, it's also housed successful Broadway shows, musicals, rock concerts, and special events like the GOP presidential debates. Uh, Governor Reagan was here. Oh, how I wish he was here. Uh, a theater such as the Des Moines Civic Center could never survive on ticket sales alone. Bloomquist says the only way the center can hope to stay alive is with the help from the pocketbooks of the public as well as private sectors. So far, Bloomquist says they have done well in contributions from the public. To date, the center has received more than $390,000 in private money. The area the center is lacking financial assistance from is its home base, the city of Des Moines. We had hoped the city would give us 10% of the hotel motel tax, but they turned us down last night, so it looks like we're going to have to try to change their minds. Uh, is that going to be difficult? Well, the vote was four to three, so I think if we could just get one gentleman to change his mind, well, we could come on our own. Bloomquist says he wishes the city fathers would take an example from the Polk County Board of Supervisors, who decided last week to give the center $20,000 from the county's hotel and motel tax. But according to at least one council member, that money from the city will probably be a long time coming. I don't think they need it. I had made an obligation I would try to provide some tax relief to the taxpayers or they would see some of this benefit. And uh, I think that's my first obligation. If they were going belly up over at the Civic Center, I would give it serious consideration to give them some. But they don't need that money right now. They're just being selfish. As for the future of the center, our investigation has turned up two different opinions. 
if they continue with that kind of deficit and they keep coming to us with their hand out, I would say that the city just let them go belly up and the city take the function over like we do with the Vets Auditorium and run it. I'm sure that we could run it at a cost-effective program. Well, I suppose there is something in the offering where, or some time where they might change some sort of management where it may do, be some sort of city run, but that would be the last resort. I know we as a private corporation want to run it the way we're running it now, and uh, we hope that we can get it so that we can do this for the benefit of the city. It certainly brings in a lot of patrons, a lot of money into the city. It's a necessary part of any convention. Uh, I'm a member of the Convention Bureau, and uh, they wouldn't have me there if they didn't think I did a lot of good. So we all work together, and it's all for the good of the city. So I think that I don't think there's any chance that the building will ever be closed. Really. As time passes, it's becoming more and more apparent to Bloomquist that as well as being manager of the center, he also has to be a politician as well. I find I am, yes. Uh, I'm more, uh, I'm a politician with my own board. I've never worked with 24 people before, as opposed to a straight line type operation like I had at KRT Theater where I could just ask one man, can I do this? And if he said no, I tried to find a way to go around so he'd say yes later, whereas when you got an answer to 24, it's a much more diplomatic situation and it's a little more difficult for me, I have to admit. It's probably the biggest transitional problem I have. Jerry Bloomquist is not new to the theater business. As he said before, he managed the old KRT Theater. He was in charge there for 13 years prior to its closing back in 1972. Well, it was originally a Shrine Auditorium built by the Shriners and then sold to the Coles. And we redone it as a theater. It was, it was really a beautiful building and still is. So. We took our interview over to the KRNT Theater. And to our surprise, we discovered it's been a number of years since the veteran theater manager has been back. Jerry, after working here 13 years, I imagine you have a lot of fond memories, don't well, you? It's the first time I've been back since I left. I haven't been here before. I haven't even been around the building. It looks good. I'm glad. sorry to see the marquee down, but other than that, well, it still looks like the same building I manage. How do you feel about it being here? Well, it gives you a little nostalgia. You know, you think back to all the good old times you had here. But you got to look forward, and I'm down the other building. i got to work down there. Do you feel there was destined to move aside and make way for something new, a theater? Oh, I'm sure that was bound to happen. I just wish that we would have had a transitional period where we would have kept this building still alive while we built the other one. We wouldn't have lost half the audience that we lost. And that's been one of our problems. We haven't gained it all back yet. We're going to do, do the best we can, and we're, we're gaining, but it's still a long haul. And we've lost some of it to C.Y. Stevens, some to the vets, some to the golf course, some to the television. But it's all good things, and maybe the changes would have come like that. We've got a smaller theater now, and it should, with a little programming help, why we ought to be able to make it go. The Civic Center Board is currently compiling a list of candidates for manager of the center. Bloomquist's position ends March 31st. He told us he hasn't reapplied for the job, but he also hasn't ruled out that possibility. Bloomquist says whoever gets the job, though, is going to be in for a lot of work. The roles of women are changing. This can be seen in the increasing number of women who are entering the job market. Our Tom Friedman joins some of these working women at both their jobs and at home and reports that the working role can be difficult as well as rewarding. Well, I'm not proud. I don't think there's anything wrong with women working. I'm for it as long as it doesn't interfere with family life and the care of children. You have as much right to work as the men have. I think it's real good. They should. If they're going to draft them. I guess, you know, it's all right if they work. I think that the wife should be there at all times. They want to work, let them work. Well, I'm one myself, so. <laughs> if there's a question between them working and taking care of the children, I think the children should come first. Women working? Oh, I think it's great. You know, it's great for a single woman, you know. <laughs> Chauvinist, huh? <laughs> should women work? As you've just heard, the answers vary. Perhaps this is because of changes in society, technology, and the economy. Marriage and motherhood are still respected. However, for the most part, they are no longer considered lifetime careers. So an increasing number of women are now looking outside the home for identity and fulfillment. This means hard times for women who have never been in or want to get back to the working world. Women are their worst enemies. They think that they can't do something. and. Uh... They really oftentimes can, once they can get past some of those feelings of inadequacy. Since today's job market is extremely competitive, more and more women are returning to school to learn the skills they need to make it. 
Jackie Powell is one of that brave new breed. Jackie's working on an advertising degree. She left school in 1961 to get married and raise a family. Three years ago, she returned to the academic scene after not hitting the books for 15 years. It's sort of a dream after, you know, going for three years and having everyone, your father and your mother and your husband, ask you for 15 years, you know, when you're going to uh, go back to school, um, it becomes a dream to finish it. Since returning to school, Jackie needs a little more cooperation on the home front, and she gets it. Her husband and two children, 12-year-old Trent and 15-year-old Jill, are very supportive. I simply feel that college education is important, not only for the wage earner and their family, but uh, in case something happens to the wage earner, that she has something to fall back on. I think it's great. Um, she's, for as many years as I can remember, she's always set this goal that she wanted to go back whenever we got into the right town. And now that we finally moved back, you know, she's finally going back. I think it's really great. Jackie's lucky. Her family has a very positive attitude about her scholastic endeavors. And since her family is nearly grown, she does not have child care worries, but she does have other concerns. Worry about grades. I, I think as long as I'm there, I might as well, you know, uh, get a good grade. So I do study a lot. Jackie's degree is close at hand. She hasn't decided yet whether she'll take her new learned skills and put them to work in the job market, but she soon will have that choice. Mary Jo Talkington has made that choice. Mary Jo does not have to work. She chooses to. Getting a job to me is just another stage of my life, another growing process. Mary Jo is a customer relations representative at a local bank. She landed this position after graduating from Iowa State in 1978. However, this isn't Mary Jo's only job. She's also a wife and mother. The main reason that I wanted to go back to work was for me. And that may seem selfish to a lot of people, but it has enhanced not only my life, but the life of my family. Uh, it's made my children more independent. It's helped Alan and I in our relationship. I have something to converse about. I have something to share outside of the home rather than just, you know, how many rooms did you clean today? Uh, did you bake a cake today? Or when I go out, I can't, I don't just talk about my children. I have other things to share, things that happen to me during the day. It makes me feel more of a person. Yeah, I'm behind her. At first, I wasn't. I was the old, uh, what do you say, the old normal way, no, you stay at home, you know, but I could see that that wouldn't work out. And I think if I'd have tried to force it that way, it would have made the marriage worse, really. So I finally saw the light, more or less, and she went back, and I think it was better for both of us. Having a working mom means no one has to sit on 14-year-old Brett and 15-year-old Tracy to pitch in around the house. Sometimes I vacuum the carpet. I don't exactly love that, but I do that once in a while. I know I have to help her because she's been working and everything, so no, it doesn't bother me, though. The real test of this cooperation comes at dinner, when everyone wants to talk about their day, but their tummies tell them to get the food on the table. I still have a lot of rapport with my children. I hope that never leaves. But right now, I still have a lot of rapport with them, and, and they want to share it, and they want to talk about it. And you've got to. You've got to do it right now. You can't say, hey, let's talk about it later, because later, you know, she has homework to do. I have maybe something I have to do in the kitchen or, you know, whatever. So you have to pick up on them right now. And so that's why it's so chaotic at our house at supper time. But that really, we... Supper time to us is a really a special time. With dinner ready, the Talkingtons sit down to their one meal of the day they share together. Mm -hmm. Bless us, O Lord, and the gifts that we have before us. Amen. 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 But not all women are as fortunate as Mary Jo. Sandy Wing works because she has to. Sandy is divorced, so she needs this job to support herself and her son. I don't like to work myself. Um, my own personal feelings are that my place is in the home. Because of Sandy's schedule, the time she and Christopher share together is very limited, therefore special, and sometimes very entertaining. One, two, three. Okay. 
in the morning, it's very difficult for both of us because I have to go off and leave Christopher and he has to get himself off to school by himself. He doesn't mind coming home at night when no one's here. It seems like you'd like it if your mother was home more often. Yeah, I would. Why? Well, someone here when I get home from school to make me a snack or something. Well, he doesn't come out and say, Mother, dear, may I do this? And he was, is, always, is always very cooperative and uh, does what's asked, and so that's been no problem. No. Sandy would eventually like to return to school and work on a master's degree in political science so she can land a better job. Were I to marry again in the future, um, I still would continue to work because I don't feel any longer in uh, our society today that the woman has the luxury of staying home. The stories of the women you've just seen are not unique. They are only examples of women looking to join or already involved in the workforce. All that we're saying is circumstances and choices are more available and more complicated than they have been in the past. And in meeting these challenges, women are discovering they can use their interests and abilities for a career. Not just a job, but for a vocation that offers personal and economic growth. Better qualifications for the business of living. Coming up next, Chris Abel reports on how we can spread a little sunshine this weekend. Please stay tuned.